Hey, I'm Brett Dolan. It's always my pleasure to talk to coaches and athletes around the country. It's March. It's WNIT season, so we're going to Indianapolis. We're going to talk basketball with Austin Parkinson, the head coach at Butler, whose team is ready to jump into the WNIT with the home game. And, Coach, before we talk about the progression of the program and how you've built this, uh, what's the excitement level just preparing and practicing to play in March in a postseason tournament? Well, for this program, it's a really, really big deal. Um, you know, we feel like it's a, a great step in the right direction. Uh, I have so much respect for the WNIT. Uh, at my old school IUPUI, um, they had never been to postseason play, and the first tournament that we were ever able to uh, qualify for was the WNIT. And uh, we played in that, I think, six or seven times, and it really propelled us and helped us grow. And so uh, there's a lot of excitement from our kids right now that we're playing in March uh, this time of the year, and, and we've got another game ahead of us. The WNIT means different things to different people, and I think that's well explained. It was a couple of years ago before COVID. I watched Arizona win the whole thing, and then once they got into the tournament after COVID, they go to the national championship game, and other teams just kind of building to get there. And I know sometimes we focus in on, well, who's in, who's out for the NCAA tournament. We forget there's programs that are building that this means something to them, that it's important for the players. It's the next step. And I don't know about you, but that kind of always gets me excited to watch teams that really are excited to be playing basketball. Oh, absolutely. And I think what you just said is a huge part is that idea of being excited about playing. Uh, we've got a, a good group of kids. We start three freshmen um, and we've got a group that will be coming back next year. So they see this as a, as a great opportunity. Um, we played some of our best basketball toward the end of the year, won five out of our last six, uh, six out of last seven, something like that. But then uh, had a tough game on our senior day. And then in the conference tournament, uh, we just didn't shoot very well. And uh, so uh, it's great that we're getting this opportunity to kind of reset, refresh, and and get a chance to play uh, tomorrow night. I thought about that, too, because if you don't play well in your conference tournament and you're done, it's kind of an empty feeling because you're like, we want to play another game. We want to keep playing. And when you don't have an opportunity, it's 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 uh, it's kind of difficult to ride off into the offseason, still that, that desire to keep playing. Well, I think the other part about it, too, is so – in our particular case, um, when I got the job a year ago, you know, I inherited a team that won one game. Uh, we won 11 last year. And uh, this year, I thought we took several steps. You know, we went on the road and beat a Big Ten team in Wisconsin. Uh, we went on the road and beat a top 50 team in Villanova. And so there's incremental steps that are taking place. But that next piece is the postseason. Like, what does that look like? You know, if you're going to have success in the future, you know, it's a different uh, it's a different deal and it's a different set of parameters you've been beating up on uh, you know, conference play for, for almost two and a half, three months. Now we get a chance to go play somebody um, that, that, you know, we're unfamiliar with. And so it's going to be a fun time and an exciting time. I want to come back to that progression and how you built this program. Again, you mentioned that you went through that stretch. I think you, you lost nine of 10 at one point, but then you came back and won five of six. What changed for you guys in the belief system after a kind of a rugged stretch and a tough schedule to be able to get back on track then in February going into the conference tournament? Yeah, you know, for the first part, we had a pretty solid non-conference. We were eight and three, and then we came out of Christmas and and just kind of struggled. Had a couple games that I thought we could have got and and didn't, uh, and then played some really tough opponents. You know, right in a, a series of games. But the big thing was we had one of our key players out. She's our best defensive player, and Jordan Melmans, uh, and I think she's like top five in the country in three point percentage. Um, but once she got back, it gave us a little bit of depth. And um, and then the other part is we our, our freshmen have been. Uh, progressing nicely in the way that they've played. Each of them have done different things really well. And, um, you know, we we start, we were close. I, I'd say a turning point for us, we played Creighton at home. Uh, they were top 25 and uh, we were ahead at halftime. Now we weren't able to close the deal out, uh, but in past years, Creighton's really put a hammer on us. So that was an encouraging moment that kind of, I think, gave the kids confidence as we finished and, and headed down the stretch and and then really got some nice wins along the way. You mentioned Creighton. I mean, you've got a tough league. UConn's in there and yet, you played Wisconsin, you played Vandy, you played Iowa State, so you're not afraid to step out of your schedule. But I don't know if people recognize when you start talking about the Big Ten or the SEC or whatnot that the Big East has some really good women's basketball too. Oh, Big East is incredible. I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I I grew up in Big Ten country. So, uh, you know, I played at Purdue University, so obviously I'm familiar with that. Um, but the Big East play – uh, and, and the talent in the league. But I would say this, the coaching in the Big East is incredible. You've got some amazing coaches. The other thing I like about the Big East is uh, you can look at certain leagues and there's a certain style, a certain, 
you know, way certain teams play. The Big East is very eclectic. You know, you've got motion teams in Villanova and Creighton. You've got the, I mean, overwhelming talent of UConn. You've got the physicality of Marquette. You got the athleticism of Seton. Like, so your roster has got to have a lot, a lot of flexibility to the way you play. But I also think it does a good job of preparing you if you have an opportunity to play in postseason. Yeah, I like that, and that's that's exciting too. Just to talk about the different styles and brands of basketball. And Austin, we've kind of teased the fact a couple of times you inherited a one-win team, and last year eleven wins. You've built that even bigger this year. This is not the first time you've done this, but when you inherit a one-win team. There's no shortage of things to do. How do you prioritize installing that belief versus just the your system and everything else? Where does belief come into play for young women as far as, hey, we can turn this around in a couple of years if you give me your best effort and I give you mine? Yeah, I think it's I mean, it's a challenge. I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, this was is a rewarding year, but also a fun, you know, a, a fun year, but a challenging year. And from the standpoint of, you know, not just one uh, one win, they were getting beat by 22 points a game. And so. Uh, kind of an interesting moment last year. We played St. John's to open up conference play. And, uh, you know, we were we were down, you know, at halftime. And the kids were kind of like, you know, hey, we can play with these guys. And ultimately, we lost by like eight or ten. And as a coach, you know, I looked at the game. I felt like, hey, that's a game, you know, I think we could have won. In their mind, they were like, well, we didn't get beat by 30. So, like, that's a – and so it's flipping that mentality. Um, you know, I, I thought this year there was a, a, a really neat moment and a loss – um, you know, after we'd won several games in a row, we went to Georgetown and uh, Georgetown had a great year, played really well this year. And uh, we went up there, battled uh, there was like 20 lead changes and we lost the game. And after the game, the kids were really down and down in the sense that they felt like, hey, like, you know, that was one we could have won. It would have really increased our seating in a conference tournament. But that's just such a dramatic shift from that point, you know, a year ago at the beginning of conference play at St. John's to you know, playing a road game and losing uh, and the and the shift in mentality. And there's a lot of stuff that goes in between that. I mean, uh, it is not uh, always pretty. It's not always, you know, there's some hard moments in there. But, you know, I'm proud of the way the kids are continuing to, to you know, buy in and, and see that change. Well, it makes sense. You change expectations at some point and you change expectations by playing better, by expecting to win, by being disappointed in losing. And I, I could see where going into that locker room or coming into practice the next few days, you realize that things had shifted just a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I think the other part too, is, as you're going through this process, there's different ways teams have, you know, built rosters. Um, you know, some teams are eight to nine, uh, you know, uh, transfers every year. You know, I don't think for us, that's going to be sustainable, but you know, we've had some new pieces, uh, you know, last year I graduated my leading score. My second leading score uh, ended up being out for the year with an injury and then we had a new point guard. So there were a lot of pieces to mesh. But what's exciting about this WNIT, I think that there is a, a great group of kids that are going to play in this tournament. And then as we go into next year, we've got something to look forward to and some continuity as we go in the offseason. And I think that's a, you know, that's a big piece of what we need to have. I would agree because I think sometimes teams are veteran senior laden and they just want to keep playing. But I think where the WNIT can really propel teams forward is just what you mentioned. When you have returners and it gives them a taste of postseason, that one and done, and then to be able to play at home, we'll talk about that in a second. But I, it, it does kind of just create that constant building that I know you're trying to do with this program. Well, and our goal is to create what you just said as a program, a sustainable program. I mean, the one thing I was really proud about at my last school is you know, we were a consistent, we weren't one year first, next year, ninth, you know, we'd like to create something consistent and you can't skip steps when you do that. Um, you know, you can't be flash in the pan. You got to create the culture and you've got to create consistency, but that continuity piece is important in developing players. And, you know, in this day and age in college basketball, which is, you know, the wild West at this point, um, you know, trying to be able to develop those players, keep those players, you know, I think is really important, but, as you mentioned, going to the NIT, you know, you're going to have a team like uh, uh, Bowling Green. Similarly, they've got a new coach. He's done a great job. They've got to be excited to play. We're excited to play. And uh, I think it's about being appreciative of the fact that, you know, hey, you've worked for this, but it's also a reward. This is the rewarding part. All those months in the gym, like the, the postseason is the reward. And I think it's important to keep that perspective. Yeah, I can see where that would make sense for a young lady, too, because, again, we're kind of in this crazy era where should we play, should we not play? And there's so much conversation. I really just enjoy following teams that want to be there, want to keep competing and and playing. And it sounds like your team does. And 
you know, Austin, I'd be remiss if I didn't go back because we've talked about your build here, but you did this at IUPUI. You inherited a three-win team there and built that program up. So are there any similarities between your former job and this job, or is every job different as far as kind of those steps you talk about that you don't want to, you don't want to skip? It's similar and different, similar in the sense that, um, you know, the, the not having had success before and changing that mentality. Uh, the difference I would say though, is, you know, this was pre NIL pre transfer portal. Um, and, you know, one of the things I, there was a very successful player for me at, at IUPUI that, you know, I think early in her career, she might've transferred um, when things got a little tough and, and that kid actually ended up staying it out uh, was one of my favorite success stories. One of my favorite players I've ever coached. And ultimately in, in one of our championship moments, she was the player that rose up. Now it's a different time. Uh, you know, that you get the, the, the transfer portal is cool. Um, you know, it's one of those things that you get to the end of the year and, um, you know, it's, it's a different situation in the sense that, um, you know, it's great that, that with, if it doesn't work out, kids can go places, but at the same time, when you're trying to teach life lessons and growth and, and, you know, uh, overcoming adversity, I think that's one of the biggest things I see is, um, you know, the moment it gets hard, well, I got, I want to, you know, uh, let me find something else. And and then, you know, that's, that's not how, uh, you know, that's not how it works. When I got in my coaching career and I was passed up several times, you know, I could fold the tent or I could say, Hey, listen, this is, you know, I just got to stick with this. And um, so they're, they're, they're different. It's a different climate nowadays, but uh, it's, it's still rewarding to see, you know, the growth and the buy-in and um, you know, the, the, it's been neat this year, something for us, like we set a record for attendance, you know, season tickets, like, you know, there's just little things that you're trying to do and increase as you're building the program. And, uh, you know, we're excited about that. That's well explained about the different eras. And I'm with you. I think we're both old enough where we could go back and have stories and anecdotes about players who would have left had that option been available to them that stuck it out that ended up benefiting from that. And I'm always wondering if we're skipping something where, you know, it's nice to focus your right on the players that go to another stop and maybe their current situation wasn't working out and it works out for them. But I wonder about the kids that it would work out at their current stop or situation that leave and it doesn't at the next level. And if we're doing a disservice to some of these kids because, you know, a little stick to and little hard work and maybe this situation that you're at will benefit you. And if you leave and you doesn't, you know, you're just kind of a rental at the next stop maybe. So I'm wondering if, if, you know, we're just missing a a layer of kids that uh, that are too easy to to leave and transfer. Well, it's tricky. I mean, I think transferring can be a positive thing, and and in the sense that you know, I'll give you a a, a great example of uh, on our team right now. Ari Wiggins um, went to Michigan, uh, which is an incredible program, and they have a lot of success during the NCAA tournament right now. And she gave it two years, and that was one of those things for her. Uh, you know, I don't think she was going to uh, in their system play. Uh, beyond that, they obviously recruit really good players. She had a chance to come back home um, and, you know, her families that are at the games, she's done a great job and she's helping, you know, helping, you know, rebuild this program as an integral part of what we're doing. That's a, that's a, that, to me, that's a beautiful story. That's a success story. Um, but then the other sense, like, you know, I think I saw something yesterday, like I, on the portal, there were like 39 kids that were the leading scores on their team, all leaving. And it's like, you know, is, is that, is that healthy? Is that, is that, is that great for, you know, basketball? Is that great for, you know, the growth? I say this, I played for Gene Katie, who was a hall of famer. Okay. Uh, but I think we all know coach Katie, you know, not an easy guy to probably play for at times. Uh, but I remember calling my father and being like, dad, I don't know, you know, I don't know if I can do this. And, and, and he gave me the talk of, you know, son, here's the big picture and whatnot. And, you know, the reality was it was a, it was a great thing for me and, and for my character and, and, you know, my learning experience and, uh, you know, being able to push through that. So there's, there's both sides of the coins. It can be a very beautiful thing and a very uh, productive thing for young ladies. Uh, but also at the same time, the sense of, uh, you know, uh, just the grass isn't always greener, you know what I mean? And, and, and at that point you, you know, it's, it's tough. Um, and then the other thing is people don't talk about it is like when you're, when you're, you know, transferring, um, you know, you're at a place three years, you're in a major and a business major, you know, if you're transferring to another school, a lot of times you're not transferring and, uh, you know, those credits don't always transfer. So you're probably not transferring to the same major. So there's a lot of different things involved that have, you know, have shifted a little bit. No doubt. 
as a Hawkeye, I remember Gene Keedy, well, uh, Katie Well, and I'm sure there were a few of those nights. Where <laughs> you go home and you wonder if that's going to work out. Before I jump back into your team, you know, while we're talking about that, you were a men's basketball assistant before you were a women's basketball assistant. What was that transition like? Yeah, it was an incredible um, situation. So I had the opportunity to work for Ron Hunter, uh, who was a uh, uh, great person to learn from. I felt like I learned uh, as much about being a head coach, observing him and our, our day-to-day meetings. Uh, he was a full 2-3 zone coach. Uh, I played only man-to-man in college with Coach Katie, so I got to learn that. Um, but it was definitely, you know, a different dynamic. And, and going into my third year working for him, uh, they fired the coach uh, at IUPUI four days before the first practice. Uh, they were restricted on scholarships. Uh, there was a story in USA Today about, you know, kind of a, a verbal abuse type thing. And so they came to me and said, hey, We'd like you to be the interim coach for the year. And uh, beyond that, no guarantees. You can apply, you can not. You know, Coach Hunter was fortunate enough to, kind enough to let me do that. And uh, that team had won three wins before that. We won four. Now, for all the things we've done in a positive way over the years, I still think those four years or four wins, they could do a Disney movie about it uh, because it was it was so, so wild. But um, it was from there that I had the opportunity to, um, you know, take over that program at IUPUI. And, um, you know, we went on to do some, some really special things over the years. And then I'll always be grateful that, you know, Mike Moore was the AD. He took a chance on me. Didn't have to. It was a, he was in an unenviable position. And, uh, you know, I was able to make the most of it. And it was a, it was a really neat deal. Austin, if you're not a popular speaker on the coaches convention circuit, you should be. I mean, you know, the life experiences that you can kind of throw out there that maybe not everybody gets to participate in or partake in, and maybe that's a good thing. But I mean, there have been some, you know, peaks and valleys or some ups and downs as you've built your personal journey and career. Yeah, it's definitely not been a straight line. I remember at one point, um, you know, I graduated from Purdue. Um, my dad's the all-time assist leader. My grandfather's a Hall of Famer in, you know, at the University of Kentucky. And so I got into coaching naively. I just thought, well, I was a point guard. I know the game. I've got a lot of contacts. I'm just going to boom. I'm going to be, you know, whatever Big Ten assistant. And uh, I quickly found out that was that's not how it works. And uh, I was a dobo making, uh, you know, doing laundry, making milkshakes at, you know, 7 a.m., uh, I was a GA at the University of Indianapolis. Like my journey was one that that you know it was a uh, in interesting path. The other part though is that I, I appreciate is like you know when we were at IUPUI we had uh, kind of the smaller budgets. We didn't have a marketing staff any of that stuff. So you know as the head coach I'm learning how to Photoshop. I'm I'm YouTube and how to do. Uh, I mean I can still see me driving downtown Indianapolis with a uh, green screen out the side of my car. Uh, trying to avoid hitting cars, carrying that in the locker room. We did our own videos. I taught, you know, so it was that building of the process to sell the program, grow the program that was really challenging. But at the same time now, like, you know, when I'm at Butler and we're in the Big East and, you know, we have all these, you know, incredible amenities, you know, I, I'm like, hey, I, I can still do that. I, and I have to learn now, okay, hey, pass this off. You do it. You take care of it. Uh, because I didn't have that as we were, as we were going up. I love that. That's fantastic. Let's finish talking about your team in this game again, because you guys average about eight and a half made threes a game. You really shoot the basketball well. I cover a lot of women's basketball. I'm in the SEC and I kind of bounce around. And sometimes I always look at the stats and the number of teams that are shooting 32 or 33 percent from three. I'm like, well, why are we doing this if we can't make more shots than this? Your team makes threes. So how important is that for you going forward on a night when, you know, you, you want these to fall to be able to provide you your points? Yeah, the way this team's you know made up, and and again, we we I would say probably uh, are, are something that'll improve in the years to come is that we'll have more depth. Uh, we lack a little, you know, punch and depth from the standpoint that um, we don't have a lot of guys that are that are beach off the dribble and get to the rim. So what we do have one through four, we shoot the ball really really well, and uh, over the course of the year, uh, we don't put a ton of emphasis on you know, hey, we got to get X amount of threes up. It's more about trying to be efficient, you know, get the ball moving. I don't like when the ball sticks, um, but we do have to make shots. And, uh, you know, against Providence in the conference tournament, we went 10 for 32, and I bet 28 of them were the most wide open shots we've had all year. And it was just a strange deal. It was a frustrating, you know, part of it. And, uh, you know, as this program grows and gets better, the defensive side of things, we'll be able to defend and keep ourselves in those type of games. 
right now, that's just not who we are. I mean, we've improved defensively, but we got to make some shots at the other end. And, you know, there's been a lot of times this year we've been able to do that. Games in Hinkle, special place. Um, you know, I bounce around the country and I broadcast college football every weekend. My first game this past year was Ohio State in Indiana. So we stayed in Indianapolis. And on Saturday morning, I said, I'm going to drive over and I'm going to knock on every door. And, I'm, you know, I couldn't get in. I wanted to get into Hinkle just to see it. Um, it, it is a special place. Give, give me an idea of what it's like to play home games there and just walk in and practice there and and, and what you might expect from an atmosphere with, with your fans in this game. Well, I would give you a background for me. You know, I growing up in the state, um, semi-state championships were held there all growing up, you know, Butler basketball games growing up. So, you know, I grew up coming to Hinkle and sitting in, you know, the the top level and smelling the popcorn and the atmosphere. And, you know, I always said, and this is prior to working at Butler, I always said it was one of the top three places, you know, I'd been been to in the country. Um, and I'd been to Fog Allen Fieldhouse and, you know, some of those. But it's an electric place. Uh, you can sense the history of it. Um, I think the horse pulleys, my understanding, are still in the bottom of the, the basement from when it was built. But, you know, basketball in Indiana, we're, we're a basketball rich state. Uh, we appreciate the traditions. So every time I walk out there, I just feel um, incredibly blessed. In fact, when I got the job, the, the offices are on the third floor. And so when I was offered the job, I walked out to call my wife and I was staring down at the floor and it was just such a surreal moment to go, wow, I get a coach here every single day uh, and be part of it. So, um, you know, we're excited for the game weeknight game. Um, you know, we're a quick turnaround of, you know, trying to get the uh, people to games and, and fans there. But, um, you know, like I said, we've had an increase in attendance this year. Um, the thing that's been neat to see is we've had a lot of repeat uh, customers, uh, people that have come, hey, let's check these guys out, see what it's like. And then you're seeing them again. They're bringing their, you know, family members. They're bringing their, you know, their daughters. And, uh, you know, that's something that we're really looking forward to as we build this to to make Hinkle the atmosphere that's capable of being. I think it's another story of the WNIT, Austin, that sometimes goes unnoticed. And whether that was, you know, the sellout I saw it in Arizona in 2019, but even last year at Fall Gallon Fieldhouse, Kansas hosts six games. And, you know, talking to their coach afterwards, their fan base just built. I mean, the fans started to get into the the tournament and they started to show up and it was the access to the players and it was the ability to sit closer than they would in a men's game. And it felt like they built some fans going forward. And I don't know how many home games, you know, that, that this might generate, but it does give another opportunity just to kind of engage with your customers. Well, I think the, the first part is that we you know, just around the building, the the staff at Butler, the people in the building, the security guard, you know, they're talking about it. They're excited about it. So that to me is just a step that, hey, we're playing basketball in March and we're playing basketball in Hinkle in March. Um, and as you said, if we were fortunate enough uh, to move on and, and and then maybe get some more games, you know, that thing can really build. And uh, I, I'm really good friends with Amy Williams that was as a Nebraska now. And, you know, I remember their run at South Dakota and the way that thing you know, just kept growing and growing and growing. And, and the reality is that fan base was never the same after that. It's always been, you know, they're they're packing that place out, but that build took place during the WNIT. And uh, so I think like to your point, uh, this can be a real momentum changer for, for programs. Glad you mentioned that. Two years ago, South Dakota State hosting the WNIT championship. People lined up in a sellout crowd to get in propel the team forward and the fan base as well. So I'm with you. You know, they also say, Austin, that uh, the committees at the NCAA level have a sense of humor. And I guess the example is Trev Alberts leaves Nebraska and goes to A&M, and then A&M and Nebraska play in the tournament for the men and the women. So if you win this game, you get Purdue, uh, So, <laughs> uh, which would be kind of a fun aspect, I'm sure, for you as well. Yeah, interesting. I mean, we actually scrimmaged them this year in a, a close scrimmage uh, just mainly because we we you know aren't going to play too much during the regular season, but um, honestly, I think for both teams, if if that were you know, if we're fortunate enough to move on, you know you've got some familiarity there. And you talked about this time of the year just being ready to go, wanting to play. You know, I think for both teams, everybody's going to be excited about you know an in-state matchup if if we're able to do that. But you know, the reality for us is uh, we are not a veteran group. Uh, we do not have the ability to. Uh, look forward. We've got to make sure that we are ready to go tomorrow night because this Bowling Green team, uh, they've got veterans. They got kids that have played in postseason play and uh, they can shoot the ball really well. And it's funny that we played Bowling Green two years ago when I uh, IUPUI and the point guard, I text our staff. I said, does she still like to go this direction? And I remembered that from our from our game. But that's 
that's how veteran this group is that, you know, uh, I've coached against a couple of these kids a few years ago at a different school. So um, we know it's going to be a tough matchup with Bowling Green. Wow. That's, that's fun too. Butler Bowling Green, first round of the WNIT Austin Parkinson was our guest. Austin it was great visiting with you, not just about your team this year, but kind of the excitement of playing in the postseason and what you've been able to do with this program. I know it's not easy. And sometimes we kind of gloss over the work to get to the results. And I know, you appreciate the journey, and, and there's been a lot of hard work. So uh, I know we'll be kind of looking forward to seeing how this game shakes out. But even more importantly, what you guys look like in years going forward, because I have a feeling the climb's going to be fun. Well, I appreciate it, and we are looking forward to it. Best wishes. All right, thank you.